We picked up nine melanomas that week. Those patients are very grateful that we did this big access week. We did 172 biopsies and 135 of those were skin cancer or atypical lesions. And for the patients who needed super special or subspecialty care, we got those folks to the lupus clinic and the bullous disease clinic and all of these other specialized clinics as well. So increasing uh, access like that actually really, really does improve the quality of care overall when you, when you take in all of those diagnoses we just talked about. Welcome to a and Healthcare Industry Group's What's Your Moonshot podcast series where world-class healthcare leaders seek to solve big problems. Listen as we talk to today's health system CEOs about the journey to achieve their moonshots. Welcome to AM's What's Your Moonshot podcast series. I'm Chris George, a Managing Director in the Healthcare Industry Group and leader of our health system practice. Today, I'm joined by Pat Jordan, Chief Operating Officer of Dartmouth Health, and Dr. Shane Chapman, Chair, Department of Dermatology at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and Professor of Dermatology at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth on the podcast. Dartmouth Health is New Hampshire's only academic health system and the state's largest private employer, serving patients across Northern New England. Dartmouth provides access to more than 2,000 providers in almost every area of medicine, delivering care at its flagship hospital, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire, as well as across its wide network of hospitals, clinics, and care facilities. Through its historical partnership with Dartmouth and the Geisel School of Medicine, Dartmouth Health trains nearly 400 medical residents and fellows annually. Pat joined Dartmouth Health in 2017 as the COO, overseeing the operations to ensure the ongoing delivery of efficient and effective operations and shared services. Dr. Chapman joined Dartmouth Health in 1999 and currently serves as the chair of the Department of Dermatology. He is also a professor of dermatology at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Welcome to both of you, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thanks, Good Chris. afternoon, Chris. Awesome. Um, so access to care is an issue we're seeing in health systems across the country and was especially brought to light during the pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit more about the genesis for your organization's moonshot? Yeah, so Chris, I think you're right. The pandemic and particularly the post-pandemic access issues nationally, uh, I think presented an immense healthcare crisis. And I think that's particularly true for uh, rural healthcare systems. And I think you know that Dartmouth is probably the most rural healthcare system. And uh, it just presented a real challenge uh, for our patients to get in to see us. Yeah, absolutely. We've absolutely seen that across the country. Um, so you've taken on some specific strategies to address that to achieve your moonshot. Dr. Chapman, can you tell us how you thought about strategizing ways to increase patient access and alleviate some of the backlog that had built up specifically sure, with your department? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I, I would just say, um, to reiterate what Pat said, you know, this is a national problem. It's not just a dermatology problem or a Dartmouth Health uh, problem. So some of the work we do here is not just for us, but I like to share it with other institutions across the country, really across the globe. Um, one thing that became obvious to us in the post-pandemic is that our backlog list in other words, patients who called and wanted an appointment, but there was nowhere to schedule them, sort of like a wait list, was growing out of proportion than, than we had ever seen before. We get about 100 new patients requests a day, and this was getting in the 200s, and thousands of patients just were not going to get a visit. And because we schedule out so far in dermatology, up to a year out, there are very few days in the future were to schedule people. So we decided to carve out a week of to see only new patients, not follow-ups unless it was an emergency, and really focus on those patients that quite frankly were at the back of the line and, and were probably never going to get an appointment, at least at our institution. And we, we kind of made it a department-wide, all hands on deck. Uh, we're going to do this. Not sure how. We're going to start planning it uh, uh, over the next, actually it took us six to seven months to get to the point of being able to do this. And by the time we got to what we called our big access week, we had 3,700 people on our wait list or on our backlog list. That's a lot. We've never had 
uh, more than that um, in our in our history. Um, and we said, we're gonna try to, to see half of these patients all in one week, about 400 people a day, 2000 for the week. Um, and we devised a, a scheduling strat strategy for that. Obviously you have to have a culture in place with your staff, with your residents, with your faculty that are gonna get on board with that sort of thing. And we just, um, the other thing we did is, is we realized that we needed a prioritization list and sometimes our secretaries have a hard time knowing what's urgent, what's not, what needs to come in today and that sort of thing. And so faculty, residents, secretaries, and our nurses uh, on, a, on a daily basis went through our, our list of thousands of patients and kind of prioritized them. We still have that structure in place today. It's really important to know, you know, who needs to come in today and, and maybe who can wait a a week or a month or so for a full skin exam where it's not so urgent. So that was our structure. That was our strategy. We put a we put a date on the calendar, December 11th to the 15th, 2023. And we just started working on making that happen over the next six to seven months. That's great. Big commitment by your department to do that really, really bold initiative. Um, Pat, why do you feel like this was the right time to embark on your moonshot journey? Because obviously, um, to put this level of commitment forward is a, is a big effort. Um, it's it's away from traditional operations and just a unique approach. Um, so why do you feel like the time was right? Yeah, so Chris, it turns out that uh, beginning in about 2023, we were updating our, our previous uh, Dartmouth Health strategy. Uh, and that strategy was blessed by the board in 2018. And the the situation had just changed so dramatically post-pandemic that in working with our leaders and in working with our board, it quickly uh, was determined that this was, you know, a major issue that rose to the top of all the things that we do. If we can't take care of these patients, they're going to get sicker. And so... You know, this is not uh, this is something that I think there is a, a absolute um, um, uniformity on. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, Dr. Chapman, back to you for a minute. What um, as you were going through this process leading up to this, the December date, um, what was the biggest obstacle you anticipated when you started? And then post the event, like what in reality became the biggest challenge throughout the process? Yeah, sure. I, you know, in thinking about that, uh, probably the biggest roadblock was us and fear, <laughs> fear of fear of failing. And I, I very consciously and intentionally tried to turn this into a learning exercise in addition to a patient uh, caring exercise. And, you know, there's whenever you've not not done something before and really anywhere there was no no blueprint anywhere for us to look at you get a little fearful and i think it's my job as the leader of the group to refocus everybody and say look this is about the patient right this could be somebody you know somebody that really needs us and i i just kept saying we may make mistakes we may not get it right the first time we're going to learn uh but we're we're going to do this and uh i need your help in in staying focused we got a lot of feedback from both faculty and our staff and our residents, as you can imagine, about why it wouldn't work. Have you thought about this? Um, and I just kept reframing those conversations to this is about the patient. And, you know, one day you're going to be a patient. And this is also an opportunity for our department and our organization to lead this in a different way. Right. We're actually going to what we learned through this. We can share with other groups. We'll internalize it a little bit. We'll tweak it down the road in the future. And quite frankly, take a little bit of the access pressure we feel every single day because we'll have this different avenue to, to see patients. So um, we, we held fast. Uh, you know, we stayed the course. And uh, uh, as, it, you know, as it turned out, it worked out probably even better than I, I thought it would in the end. Well, that's great. Just follow up question, Dr. Chapman, on that. So, so getting patients appointments is one thing. Um, what about the quality side of the equation? Um, yeah. You know, tell us a little bit more about the patient quality impact of, of what you did. 
Yeah, Chris, I, I went through that strategy pretty quickly there, but we really tried to message with patients and align their expectations with ours. We really wanted patients who needed a what I would call a brief and or focused visit. We wanted to make sure they didn't have skin cancer or melanoma or we, we solved their most pressing uh, skin problem. Uh, we, we really tried to uh, of not avoid, but move other chronic uh, dermatologic conditions to other uh, specialty clinics, which we also have, but not for this day, right? So aligning uh, patient expectations for this kind of clinic, in a lot of ways, those patients self-selected, you know, would you like to be seen today or do you want to wait another month? And, you know, if patients just had one or two, what I'll say, brief focused problems, they they um, chose to come to this clinic and we were aligned very much with those patients. I would <laughs> I would argue the quality was even increased on this particular day because everybody's antenna were up, right? We were all we were doing something special today. We were going to make sure that the dermatologic care was high quality. You had a re you were going to see a resident and a faculty member or a nurse and a faculty member and you were going to um, have have those things that were really important to you taken care of today and not wait months and months. So yes, I think when people talk about these kind of big clinics and maybe a shortened appointment, this was a maybe a shortened appointment with the MD, but it was not a shortened appointment. And our patient satisfaction uh, was a 3.8 out of four of the ones we polled as they left the clinic. So not only do I think it was high quality, the patient satisfaction was very high as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so it sounds like a successful a successful pilot. Um, was there anything that came out of it operationally that you plan on continuing um, and that will allow your organization to better manage access to care going forward? Chris, really appreciate that question. Absolute yes. We've already written five papers on this clinic in different journals. Uh, some some operational journals, even not just academic uh, dermatology journals. Um, gosh, there's so many things. Okay, uh, one thing is we realized our RNs, not nurse practitioners, not APPs, not our residents. Our our RNs. We had a little friendly competition, by the way, uh, for the RN groups uh, to compete with the resident groups, and our RNs outcompeted our residents, both on volume, patient satisfaction and all this. So when you, you talk about quality or whatever, a lot of our RNs now, we have these RN superderm pods, just so you know. I like uh, big words like big access and super, uh, super pods. And our nurses now um, are seeing, they will initiate visits with patients. I'll say it that way. And they'll get the provider, me, you know, about 75 to 90% through that visit. They get the patient prepared. They make sure their allergies are and medications are up to date. Our RNs are actually highly specialized in dermatology. They know a lot of dermatology. And so they can do a lot of patient education. And from a faculty point of view, we can, we can come in, confirm the diagnosis and treatment. So these RNs are now really focused on access. They mostly see patients within 14 days and it's totally changed our, our metrics on number of, of uh, percentage of patients seen within 14 days. So we've elevated the dermatology RN position. Uh, we've also, you know, we're probably underutilizing telehealth a lot, you know, some of access it can be done with telehealth. Not every single patient needs an in-person visit. And it's our job to figure out which ones can do telehealth first versus, you know, an in-person exam first. But um, we're, we're, we probably were underutilizing telehealth in the beginning. And a lot of what we worried about is, okay, we got all these new patients. Where are you going to do follow-up? A lot of times you just need a telehealth visit. Hey, I, I started you on that medication. Do you have any side effects? You can go get labs. I can look at the labs next week. How are you doing? And we don't we don't necessarily clog up our in person clinic, if you will, with unnecessary visits that way. So yeah, we we're still learning. We're we're still we're doing. We've done this twice um, since December. We did it in February. We did it in April. We're doing it again the first week in September. 
And our clinic and our faculty love it so much. We're doing, we're going to do it every two months forever from now on and really hope that our backlog, uh, those patients who just don't have any room for scheduling, we move them up to the front of the line with these big access weeks. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, uh, you know, access to care is, is we're all patients, right? And um, we've all yeah. had our struggles with, with getting patient appointments. You guys are actually direct, directly impacting patient lives, right? People that might not historically have had access to your system now have access, great access. So that's yeah. Yeah, Chris, I, I, let me just say this one more thing. Not and not we picked up nine melanomas that week. Those patients are very grateful that we did this big access week. We did 172 biopsies, and 135 of those were skin cancer or atypical lesions. And for the patients who needed su super special or subspecialty care, we got those folks to the lupus clinic and the bullous disease clinic and all of these other specialized clinics as well. So yes, uh, you're right. Um, get increasing uh, access like that actually really, really does uh, improve the quality of care overall when you, when you take in all of those diagnoses we just talked about. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so just a closing question, maybe Pat, we start with you. Um, what would you share with other leaders across the country who may be inspired to try and replicate your efforts in their organizations with what you've done here at Patient Access? Yeah, I, th I think, Chris, that I've learned this lesson now about a thousand times in my 35-year career. Uh, but, you know, I think this is really about leadership at the local level. We need our provider and clinical leaders to really embrace their leadership responsibility and exercise commitment to solving this huge issue. And when 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 we ask them to do it and give them the support and the guidance, uh, it turns out that they use an awful lot of creativity and innovation to do this, which is exactly what Shane has done uh, and exactly uh, you know what we're really showing the rest of the organization can be accomplished. Yeah, that's great. Dr. Chapman? Yeah, thanks, Pat. I, I actually, Chris, would have said the same thing. And I, I don't know that it's necessarily just my leadership. I'm, I've been in the department running it for 13 years. I've hired the faculty that I have. We really try hard, really hard to engage our staff and take care of them in so many different ways. And I won't go into all that right now. But this is not only just leadership at the top, but, you know, I, I would say um, we don't have any followers. We're all leaders, including our MAs and our techs. They're problem solvers. I always put a little piece of tape over their name tag and say chief problem solver, right? Um, I would say what Pat said, some of my my folks that, that you know, are, are not providers necessarily, they have some great ideas, too. I've got to listen to them, too. So I do think it starts with leadership, but at all levels. You get buy-in. I don't have to beg. And we now we have the, you know, a department with a sense of pride in that we're access problem solvers. And, and we have not solved it all by any means, but we continue to tweak it and try different things and, and move the needle that way. Yeah. No, you guys have taken important steps there. You certainly created an aspiration for, for others to achieve. Um, as I thought about what you've done, um, two adjectives came to mind for me, inspiring and courageous, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not always easy to do the difficult things. And it's great to hear that you're continuing on the path to do this every couple of months and, and keep your, your wait list down, but more importantly, getting patients in sooner yeah. um, to address any qu clinical issues that may exist. So congratulations and thank you very much for, for joining our Moonshot um, and, and wish you the best of luck with this initiative going forward. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Alvarez and Marcel. Leadership. Action. Results.